Have you ever wondered what ultimately got Jesus killed? The Jewish people and the religious leaders of the day were so offended by Jesus that they so badly wanted to kill him. But have you ever wondered why were they so offended by Jesus that it actually got him killed in the end? So today we continue with our series called I Am Jesus. Now, let me just also make that clear. The series is called I Am Jesus. I'm not at all saying that I am Jesus. It's just the name uh, of the series that we are busy doing. And the reason for calling this series I Am Jesus is because we are looking at a number of the I Am statements that Jesus made in the book of John. In the book of John, there are a number of statements that Jesus made. Um, and they are the I am statements. And today we're looking at one of these statements from John chapter 11. Now, these statements that we are speaking about, these I am statements of Jesus, is what got Jesus killed in the end. These I am statements are the statements that offended the Jewish people, the religious leaders, so much that they wanted to kill him. In uh, John chapter 5 verse 18, it says... Um, or it explains to us that it was because of blasphemy that Jesus uh, actually got killed or why the Jews wanted to kill him. These I am statements were, all of them were actually statements of divinity. In these various I am statements, Jesus was claiming to be God or at least to be equal with God. So John 5 verse 18 says, This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Then again, John chapter 10 verse 31 to 33. And, and that passage is right before the passage of scripture that we're going to be reading in John chapter 11. So it's just, this is just before the story that we'll be picking up a bit later. But it says the following. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them. I have shown you many good works from the father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him. It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now, it's quite interesting. It's, it's quite ironic that the reason why they wanted to kill Jesus was because of blasphemy, for, for claiming to be God. The irony, however, was that it was God claiming to be God. He was not sinning when he was claiming to be God because Jesus is God. And this is the biggest irony of the history. Now, I think the biggest point that I want to make here is that it's so important that we don't make the mistake to see Jesus as merely a good teacher. We should never make the mistake of seeing Jesus just as one of the religious leaders, like we get many religious leaders today. Jesus was not a motivational speaker. He wasn't just your life coach. You know, Jesus never claimed to be your co-pilot. His claims, his, these I am statements were way more serious. He claimed to be your God. Let me read you some of the I am statements. In John chapter 4, Jesus is explaining that, that I am living water. Whoever drinks from me will never thirst again. John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. And then later in John chapter 8, Jesus makes actually a, a very, very big statement when he says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, this was just too much for the religious leaders to hear at that moment because they were speaking about this divinity of Jesus, the claims that Jesus were busy making. And uh, they challenged him and he was claiming to be greater than their religious heroes, someone like Abraham. But then Jesus just goes for it and he says, before Abraham was, the father of your faith, the father of the Jewish faith, before Abraham was, I am. And he doesn't say I was. He uses the name of God, the name of God, I am. The name that God gave Moses to explain uh, to Moses who he is when he sent him back to the, uh, to the Israelites and to, uh, that were in slavery in Egypt. He says, Tell them that the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob has sent you. Tell them that the great I am has sent you. God tells Moses that I am who I am. I will be who I will be. Tell them I am sent you. So Jesus 
is actually using this name of God, Yahweh. He's claiming that he is God. Not only greater than Abraham, but actually the one that Abraham was believing in him or believing in is standing in front of you. That was, that's the claim that Jesus was making in John chapter 8. Then he goes on, John 10 says, I am the good shepherd. In John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. And we're going to be spending some time on that statement. I am the resurrection and the life, which is what we celebrate today on Resurrection Sunday. John 14 verse 6, which is a famous uh, verse where, where Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus is not saying, this is the way that you get to God. He's saying, I am the way to God. He's not telling them, this is the truth. He's saying, I am the truth. And he's, Jesus is not giving advice on how to live a better life. Jesus is saying, I am the better life. In John 15, he says that I am the vine, remain in me. You see, Jesus is not pointing to a religious system. He doesn't come and give us a religious system. He is pointing to himself. The biggest mistake that you can make is to think that Jesus is just another good teacher or to think that Jesus was a religious leader like Moses or Elijah the prophet or even Aaron the priest or to even think that Jesus is one of those religious leaders that one of the big ones like the prophet Muhammad, right? That point, uh, claims to, to actually be revealing what God's word is to people or like uh, the, the Buddha, explaining how to find enlightenment in this world. Jesus is different to them. Jesus is not the main religious leader of Christianity. Jesus is not even the religious leader of Christianity. Jesus is Christianity. Jesus is not the leader of our, uh, of our religion. Jesus is our religion. He was pointing to himself as the answer. Now that is the Jesus that we celebrate today. Jesus did not teach us a religion. He is our religion. Now we're going to spend time on John chapter 11. And I want to tell you a bit of this story. And so, so you might know the story. It's the story of Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus that dies. He was the brother of Mary and Martha, uh, whom Jesus loved very much. And so he loved this man, Lazarus, and he dies. And then Jesus goes and he raises him from the dead. It's a story of resurrection, of death and new life, of resurrection. But I want us to focus a little bit more on the characters surrounding this story. Some of the other characters that we encounter in the story, there are three characters that we encounter and each of them also experience a, a level of death inside of them. Uh, this story of Lazarus is also a story of, of disappointment. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been disappointed in your life? Have you ever been disappointed in your, in your faith walk? Have you ever been disappointed with God himself? This story is about disappointment. So the story picks up in John chapter 11. Uh, the, the friends and fa family of Lazarus come to Jesus and he wasn't too far away. He was not in Jerusalem because they, the Jews wanted to kill him. And so he was in Bethany that wasn't too far away. And so they send people to Jesus saying, Lazarus is ill. If you don't come soon, he's going to die. And so they call Jesus because he's the miracle man. He's healed thousands of people. And so they want to call Jesus so that he comes. Mary and Martha want him to come and heal their brother. Um, and then Jesus finally decides. He doesn't go right away. But when he finally decides to go, his disciples don't think it's a good idea. Because remember, in John chapter 10, they just come from the place where the Jews wanted to stone Jesus, right? They wanted to kill Jesus. And so now in verse 8, John 11, verse 8, uh, the following is said. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you are going there again. So they're saying, Jesus, are you crazy? This is not wisdom. <laughs> going back to Jerusalem, they're going to kill you. And then Jesus is adamant. He explains to them, no, 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 this is the will of God. Let, let's rather trust God. Just trust me. This is what we need to do now. And he's actually seeing that this is an opportunity because he wants to take them with and show them 
a miracle, right? And so he takes them with, he says, no, sorry, we are going to go. But then there's one disciple that is, is not too excited about this new journey, right? And his name is Thomas. We all know Thomas with, uh, you know, we all know him as Doubting Thomas. But do you know another name for Thomas that he also deserves is Sarcastic Thomas. Thomas is also very sarcastic in verse 16. And so after the disciple says, Jesus, I don't think we should go. And Jesus says, trust me, we should go. Just trust me. And then Thomas says, so Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. So you say, well, Lazarus is, death, is dead. Jesus is going to die. Let's go with him so that we can also die. He's being very sarcastic in this moment. And he is basically doubting that Jesus' plan is the right one. He's not trusting to just go with what Jesus is saying. Then the story goes on. Uh, Lazarus has been dead for four days. The Bible says he has been smelling. Uh, the King James Version says he stinketh. It's like the holy version of the word stink. If, if you stinketh, okay? If you don't want to offend someone, you tell them, you stinketh, my brother. Okay, that's the way the King James Version says. But he was, he was smelling already. It's been four days, he's dead. And then finally, Jesus gets to Martha. And so Martha and Mary, they know that Jesus is coming. Martha is, a, is, a, is frustrated. Uh, she's got something to sort out with Jesus, saying, Jesus, where have you been? And Mary is just gutted. She's just hiding away in her house. Verse 20. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then later on, so Martha and Jesus, they have a conversation. We'll pick that up a bit later in the sermon also. But then later on, uh, Mary, uh, Martha goes to call Mary, that's just still at home, not coming out to meet Jesus where he is. Now, when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, we see these characters experiencing deep disappointment. Now, what, what I love about this story, it's so honest. Their disappointment was not only that their brother Lazarus is dead. Their disappointment is, is with Jesus. They're saying, Jesus, if you were here, you wouldn't have died. You could have healed him. Why didn't you come? There's this deep disappointment, not only with life, but even with God himself. Have you ever experienced disappointment, not only with life, but also with God? The way that he does things. Have you ever felt like Thomas where you think, well, I don't know this is, if, if this is the best way, God. I don't think this is a smart way of doing things. You see, let's speak about these three characters. Thomas had doubts. Now, I'm sure I want to ask you, maybe you've had spiritual doubts also. Um, and uh, if you've had those moments in your life where you know that God is, is saying to you, it's going to be okay. Just trust me, my girl. Or trust me, my boy. It's, it's going to be fine. Just trust me on this one. You hear God saying that, but then you can't help but not doubt. You can't help but worry. You know that God is saying it's going to be fine, but you can't help but worry and doubt. That, that's Thomas for you. And I know that's you and me so oftentimes. Sometimes we doubt. And sometimes these doubts are because of disappointments. Maybe in the past you've prayed for something, but God didn't act. You trusted God for something and it didn't happen. You thought everything is going to be okay in a way that you imagined it, and it wasn't. It wasn't okay. And because of that disappointment, there's something of a, a, a death that came to your trust. And therefore, you are left in a place of doubting. Mary, on the other hand, uh, it says in verse 20, When Martha heard, the, uh, heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. It's this picture of this lady that has lost hope. She's asking, what's the point? Why go out to meet Jesus? It's too late. Have you ever felt like that? We just lost hope. 
And you, and you say to yourself, what's the point? Have you ever, have you ever said these words? What's the point of praying? I mean, God's going to do what He's going to do, but I mean, it's too late for me. Maybe, maybe you come out of a divorce and you're saying to yourself, well, it's too late for me. I've messed it up. I had my chance. I've messed it up. Maybe your kids are grown up and, and uh, the relationship is not the way that you wanted it to be. And you're saying to yourself, well, it's too late. Why try and mend the relationship now? Why try and phone my daughter or my, my, my son? What's the point? It's too late. I've messed it up so much in the past. And we lose hope when we think it's too late. The other day I spoke to a friend of mine at church and he was speaking about his job. And um, he said the following. He said, I've tried so many times to do the right thing. I've tried so many times, but no one is interested. And I've just decided I'm just going to go to work, do what I need to do, and then take my salary and go home. I'm going to stop trying. And I thought, man, that is so sad. This guy has lost hope. He's lost hope because he's saying, what's the point? And I get it. I get it because there's been so many disappointments. If you've been disappointed so badly or so often, it makes sense that you start asking the question, what's the point? What's the point? And you lose the dream. It's like the dream is, is dead. Hope is dead in us. And that was Mary for you. And then Martha. I love Martha. She's feisty. She uh, comes to Jesus and she's got business to sort out with Jesus. She's not only like she's sad because of Lazarus, but she's also angry at the same time. Right? I don't know if that's the emotion you sometimes experience. If you're disappointed, you also get angry. Uh, you're not just calm about it and sad about it and go cry about it. You want to sort out everyone that you think are in the wrong. And so Jesus uh, or Martha goes out and waits for Jesus. She's like not waiting inside that Jesus comes to the door. She's waiting out on the street, maybe on the street corner of the block. If she sees Jesus, she wants to go to him and sort of ask him, Jesus, why didn't you come earlier? We called you. Why didn't you come right away? If you came, you wouldn't have been dead. The prayer she's saying is the prayer that we sometimes say, God, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you intervene? She was frustrated because of a delay. Jesus delayed. Right? He didn't come right away. And this was disappointing. Are you sometimes frustrated by the delays of God? Maybe you, you still haven't found a husband or a wife. You've been waiting and the delay is killing you. So much so that, that you're sort of losing courage in, uh, in the process. Maybe it's, it's for parents waiting for a baby and it still hasn't come. And the delay is killing something inside of you. It's killing courage. Maybe it's a dream that you have and you're not seeing any reality to it. There's a delay in the dream, the vision that you have in your life or, or maybe in the business that you want to start. And it's just not happening. And the delay is causing you to lose courage. I've had moments like this. I, I had to wait 13 years before I could start doing full-time ministry. And uh, I remember this, this ministry that we were also involved in. We were looking for a permanent venue for the, the, the ministry. And there's something like five years. I was struggling every week, not being sure whether that Sunday we'll have a venue or not. And man, there came a point where I started to lose courage. I started to lose faith. You know, and also, you know, after waiting 13 years, I just thought maybe this is not what God wants me. I heard wrong. I heard, just heard wrong. I'm not called for, for ministry or something like that. And we start losing courage but what we need to remember is that God's delays is not God's denies God's delays is not God's denies I am so thankful because of the delay I'm so thankful because of every delay in the past because anyone that has ever had to wait for something good from God will tell you the delay is something beautiful in the end Now, in verse 22, Jesus and Martha speaking, uh, Martha says the following. Just after she said, Jesus, but if you were here, you, know, you could have saved my brother. But then after that, she says in verse 22, but I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. 
but even now. I want to encourage you. Maybe that's a prayer that you need to say today. Maybe if you are dead in your hopelessness or you've lost hope or you lost courage or even you've lost some of your trust in God or some of your faith. Maybe it's important for you today to say a prayer, say, God, even now, even if I don't see any evidence of what I've asked you for in the past, even now I will keep on trusting you. Even now I know that you can do a good work. If you can raise a man from the dead, if you can walk out of your own grave, then even now God can still do what he says he can do. God can still do what he says he can do, even now. What is dead, he can bring to life. Sometimes the greatest disappointment is an opportunity for life. Sometimes in the greatest opportunity, it's the opportunity for the glory of God. Jesus says this in verse 4, John 11. He says, when we heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Sometimes it's an opportunity for the glory of God. Sometimes your, your doubt, just like Thomas, your doubt is an opportunity for faith to be built inside of you that is so secure it cannot be shaken. Sometimes if you have been disappointed so badly, it is an opportunity for God to come and give you a greater hope than what you ever had beforehand. Just like Mary. The hope that Mary had after Lazarus was raised from the dead was so much greater than what she had beforehand. The trust that Thomas had in Jesus was so much greater after he saw what happened. And also the, 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 the patience and also the, the trusting that God will come in his time that Martha had after she experienced the resurrection of Lazarus was so much greater because of this very disappointment. Maybe God is using your disappointment, your delay, your doubts, whatever it may be. He's using that for His own glory. Pray the prayer, even now, God, I will trust in you. I want to close with the, just this statement uh, that we're actually speaking about today that comes in, in verse 23. And so John 11, verse 23, let me read from there. It says, Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Now, Martha was a good Jewish woman and the Jews in this time, or most of them, uh, believed in the resurrection at the last day. So they believed that those people who have died will once more live. There, there's going to be a resurrection at the last day. And so uh, Jesus is saying that your brother will rise again and then Martha goes to her religion. She grabs toward her belief system and saying, yes, yes, I know. I know I should have a bit of hope uh, because my brother will rise again at the last day. But she's going toward her religion, her belief system that, yes, I know that we believe in the resurrection. And then Jesus looks at her. He stands in front of her and he looks at her and he says, no, no, you misunderstand. My dear girl, verse 25, he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And so in the same way that Jesus was telling Martha, forget about your belief systems and, and your, uh, your religion. You're not going to find enough hope and faith in those things. Look at me. In the same way, I believe that Jesus is, in st is standing in front of you and in front of me. And he's saying, forget about your religion and look at me. Look at me. Let's pray. Jesus, we believe that you are the resurrection and the life. Jesus, we believe that you are the one that we, that we follow and that you are the one that we find our life in. You are the one that we find hope in. You are the one that, one that we, we, we put our faith in, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for the victory that you won when you walked out of your grave. But thank you, Jesus, that we know that your victory was our victory. And thank you that we know that you are alive today. On this Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate the fact that you are alive and that the hope that we have is not a hope for the future only. The hope that we have is a living hope because we hope in you as you are standing in front of us right now. Amen. Amen.